Amen for the music today. And indeed, I think we all need a closer walk with Jesus in the midst of what has been for many of us a very trying time. We have a hope in our hearts, a hope that keeps us in spite of our circumstances. And we can still praise God because we have this hope that burns in our heart. Amen? Amen. I want to, before we get into the word today, I want to say a word of thanks to this congregation. Uh, I know that everyone could not make it, but I praise the Lord for those that attended the funeral services last week, Thursday, for my mother-in-law in in Mississauga, Ontario, Canada, when I saw familiar faces. Now, I I expected to see some people there that I knew, uh, because I know some folk in Canada, Uh, but when I saw my family from New Jersey, now I have a bias because New Jersey is the greatest state in America, Amen. And when I saw some of my peeps, come on, <laughs> from New Jersey, uh, it made, it made the, the moment much easier to bear. Uh, and though I wasn't preaching last week, Thursday, it sure made me feel like preaching to see my church family there. Amen. Um, I, I, I cannot say thank you enough for your presence. And I know that a number of you could not make it. A number of you called and sent cards and so forth. Uh, I, I, I just want to say a thank you to everyone uh, for your prayers, for your phone calls, for your text messages, Facebook messages, um, and all of the support uh, for our family during this time. If you have your Bible, I invite you to open it to the book of Revelation, the sixth chapter. As this is the last Sabbath of what is called Black History Month, I thought the message today could be one that is in the spirit of traditional black preaching and content while giving a message of hope uh, as we look at the circumstances around us. Revelation, the sixth chapter, beginning at verse 9. John the Revelator says, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. For your consideration today, the title of the message is How Long? How long? Please bow your heads with me as we seek the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we seek your face today. Lord, we look to you as we have just opened and read from your holy word. We ask, Lord, that you might be our teacher today. We pray, Lord, that the spirit of the living God that inspired the Bible writers to pen the words that we've just read, that that same Holy Spirit might open our hearts and minds to understand and to receive your word this day. We pray that your word might be clear, that each and every one of us might understand it. But Lord, we pray that your word might be powerful that even the hardest heart might be transformed today. 
in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Scholars have wrestled throughout history with understanding the book of Revelation. It has been so mysterious to Bible scholars that in the days of Martin Luther, he actually suggested that the book of Revelation should not even be included in the canon of scripture. It was so obscure and difficult to understand. Even as a Seventh-day Adventist preacher and student of the word of God, I must admit that Revelation is not the easiest book to study. It's not the easiest book to understand all that is talked about, uh, having gone to the seminary and had to take a class uh, on Revelation and on Daniel. And in the class on Revelation, while much of Revelation is easier to understand for us as Seventh-day Adventists, there are portions that are often overlooked even in Daniel and Revelation seminars and in lessons and classes on Revelation because some of Revelation is not as easily understood as others. Today, not only are we looking at one of the more difficult books of the Bible to some, but most scholars, including Seventh-day Adventist scholars, would agree that the seven seals and the seven trumpets that are mentioned in the book of Revelation are perhaps the most difficult portion of all scripture to understand. So of all portions of scripture, it is considered that these, these passages that we have looked at uh, as a part of the seven seals and, and a part of the, the, the seven trumpets are perhaps the most difficult to understand. But I believe there is especially a message of hope when you look at this fifth seal. Uh, most scholars would agree that the seven seals, like much of the sevens of Revelation, denote uh, seven different time periods, though there is no agreement as to which time period and what seal fits which and so forth but one thing is sure that when the fifth seal is open it represents a time after which or before a time that immediately proceeds a time of great tribulation and persecution are you with me because when the fifth seal is open, there is a cry of martyrs who have been sacrificed for their witness, for their testimony about Jesus Christ. And the cry of the martyrs is simply this, how long, O Lord, until you respond? To put their message simply, their question is simply to ask God, God, we see what is taking place in the world and in the church. We feel the pains of living in this sin-cursed world. How long until you respond? A simple reading of the book of Daniel, especially in that 12th chapter, gives hope that there is a response from God to the activities on planet Earth. For Daniel 12 tells us that one day soon Michael will stand up. And when Michael stands up, God gives a response to the tragedies and the destruction that is taking place on the earth. And so the question is, how long until you respond? Now, let me give some clarifications before we get to the heart of the message. The first clarification, the Bible says that when the fifth seal is open, I saw under the altar the souls who had been slain for the word of God. And they cried with a loud voice. Now, let me give some simple clarification. I know I'm talking mostly to Seventh-day Adventists, if not all Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, but let me just make sure we're on the same page. Though the Bible tells us that these souls are crying out to God, and the Word of God tells us that these souls have been sacrificed, the Bible is not teaching some new teaching about someone dying and going to heaven and being able to talk. The first reason that we know this is the case is Revelation often uses symbolic language. The symbolic language is not meant to be taken literally. 
but symbolically. Amen. But the second reason we know this to be so, the Bible says that the voice of the slain martyrs comes from souls under the altar. Now, I don't know about you, but if it were true that you die and go to heaven, I would not want to die and go to heaven and be stuck living under the altar. Does that make sense? Huh? The Bible says that it's the souls who've been slain and their testimony comes from under the altar. They cry out with a loud voice and, and, and the Bible seems to indicate that they're speaking. But I like to suggest to you that the Bible is not describing people living under an altar who have died and gone to heaven. No, the fact that the Bible alludes to an altar tells us that this is a sacrifice that has been made. Listen to me. There's a sacrifice that has been made. And when a sacrifice is made on the altar, some of the blood gets sprinkled in the sanctuary and the remaining portion of the blood drains under the altar. In other words, just as in Genesis, the fourth chapter, when God comes to visit a man named Cain and says, Cain, what did you do to your brother? Cain says, what are you talking about? God says, Cain, his blood is crying out to me from the ground. In that same way, the Bible is saying the blood of the martyrs is crying out to God day and night saying, Lord, how long until you respond to our death? Lord, how long until you make our death worth something? Lord, how long until our death is no longer in vain? Lord, when will you respond to what's taking place? The martyr's blood cries out to God and says, how long, O Lord? Now, if you analyze what they are saying, it becomes clear that while they ask how long, O oh Lord, until you respond, what they are questioning, what they are challenging is not so much how long, but it's been too long. Lord, it's been too long watching the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper. Lord, it's been too long seeing our children be killed in schools and on playgrounds. Lord, it's been too long for you to sit up there in heaven and watch as women are being raped and molested, kids being kidnapped, drug dealers making loads of money while hardworking people are getting laid off. Lord, it's been too long. I believe maybe if you and I were honest with ourselves today, there are times in our life when we look at circumstances around us and we too want to cry out to God, God, it's been too long. You've allowed it to go on long enough. Lord, it's time to respond. How long until you respond to what's taking place on this planet? Lord, how much longer are you going to let thugs rule our streets? How much longer will you sit there while politicians lie and babies are dying and mothers are crying and soldiers are dying on the battlefield? How long, oh Lord, will you sit there and watch while we can't make ends meet, while we struggle just to survive? Lord, it's been too long. I can hear the blood of the martyrs crying out to God, God, you told us that you give us abundant life and life eternal. That following you pays, like the song says, it pays to serve Jesus. And yet, the blood of the martyrs would attest that it doesn't just pay, but it does cost. Because the blood of the martyrs is payment for following Jesus. Their blood is a constant reminder that all who suffer, or all who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. And the blood of those martyrs is a constant reminder to us that while we might live in a land that has freedom and prosperity and all the rest of the good stuff we try to enjoy, there is a time coming. and We might be comfortable now, 
But like the blood of these martyrs are crying out, we too will cry out to God if you haven't already. How long, O oh Lord, until you respond to what's taking place on earth? Now, I'd like to suggest to you that God does respond to the cries of the blood of the martyrs. There is a response from God's end of the conversation, but before it's good news, it's bad news. Stay with me. I'm going to give you some good news, something you can rejoice about. But before you get to the good news, you got to get the bad news. For the response of God, when he hears the cry of the blood of the martyrs, when he hears the growing, groaning and pains of those that dwell on the earth in response to what is taking place, God's response is, it actually hasn't been long enough. Don't you see it in the text? The Bible says, rest a little longer, verse 11, until both the number and uh, uh, the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. In other words, what God is saying is, if you look at the glass of hard times and persecution and distress and disturbances and problems and poverty and sickness and, and, and all of the bad of this planet, if you look at the cup, it's being filled up, but it is not completely filled yet. There's still more to go. In other words, God is saying it hasn't been long enough. You all have not suffered enough yet. You have not been persecuted enough yet. The devil has not done his full work. You've only seen a little bit of what the devil plans to do. There's still more to come. I know you were hoping for some good news, but, 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 but first, God is saying that, that there, it has not been long enough in response to the cry that, Lord, it's been too long before you respond. God says, no, I have not responded yet because it has not been long enough yet. Understand, when the great controversy began in heaven, the angels were kicked out of heaven. But the devil was given some time to show what he's all about. And the devil for the last 6,000 years has been showing what he's all about. But get this, watch this. For the first 4,000 years, those that dwell in heaven were watching, but they too did not fully comprehend how wicked the devil was. It was not until they watched their creator. Jesus Christ, not simply die at the hands of his own creation, but die at the hands of who was once his friend, Lucifer. When the angels in heaven saw what Lucifer was all about, they in their own mind were fully convinced it's been enough. We're ready for you to take that brother out. But watch this. We who dwell on earth are still not fully convinced. So for 2,000 years, God has allowed Satan to show what his kingdom is all about. How do I know we're not convinced? Because every time, every time we hear a word about how we should live and what we should do, yet we still go back and follow that mean old devil, Satan. Now, I know we're not convinced because we still have to be reminded every now and again to stop chasing the almighty dollar and, and put our priorities in order. How do I know we're not convinced? Because God has to keep reminding us, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. How do I know that we're not convinced? Because we still chase after the fashions and the ways of the world instead of accepting what God says about us. How do I know that we're not convinced? Because we still want to have one foot in the world and one foot in God's kingdom. How do I know that, I, that we're not convinced? Because we still enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. How do I know we're not convinced? Because we still find enjoyment 
in the devil's movies and the devil's music and the devil's foods. And, and here's the reality. The reality is, watch this. In order for God to get us to where he wants us to be, he knows the best way to get you there is not through ease. It is not through prosperity. It's not through good times. The way to get you there is through suffering. Let me just use a very, a very real and very practical example to demonstrate my point. Many of us, I hope all of us, go to the doctor at least once a year. Some of us need to go more than that. But I hope all of us go to the doctor. And you go to the doctor. Now, even if you don't know all of the health message, you know enough to know that some of the stuff you eat, you should not be eating. Am I right? And some of the stuff you might drink, you should not be drinking Am I right? <laughs> you know this. I don't need to tell you that you need to exercise every day. Am I right? I think everyone in this building knows that your body needs to exercise every single day. I don't need to remind you that you need some sunlight and fresh air. and all. I don't, I don't need to tell you that, right? You know that. But you and I will go to the doctor, am I right? And the doctor will say to you, your blood pressure is high and you need to cut back on your sodium intake. Or the doctor will tell you your blood sugar levels are high and you need to cut back on your sugar intake. Am I, am I correct? And if you're like me, you didn't need the doctor to tell you that. You already knew it. In fact, you knew it and then you cut back on it for a week or two. And that food doesn't taste as good to you. And then when you go back to see the doctor the next time, the doctor reminds you of what he already told you the last time. And you cut back for a month. And the food doesn't taste the same. Come on. You exercise for a week and a half. But then when you go to the doctor and the doctor says you have diabetes. When you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you you're this far from having a heart attack. When you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you that if you do not change your lifestyle and your eating habits, you will not see me next year because you're going to be dead. Then... You start to change your diet, am I right? It may not change in good times. Children aren't always concerned about how much soda they drink and candy they eat. But when their life will depend on it, when they're this close to death, when they're going to be taken out, then what you did not change in good times, you'll change in hard times. God understands that it is not the good times that will mold and shape our characters and make us into what God has called us to be. It's in the hard times. And so God's response when the, the voice of the martyrs is crying out, how long until you respond to our circumstances, God says, listen, it hasn't been long enough. I still have to turn the pressure cooker up just a little bit longer. The heat has to be turned up on the fiery furnace. They need to endure just a little bit more because they don't learn in the good times. It takes the hard times to teach them some lesson. It takes the hard times for their character to be shaped and molded. God's response to the question, how long, oh Lord, or the idea that it's been too long, you've allowed this to go on for too long, God's response, first of all, is it actually hasn't been long enough. The cup of persecution and trouble is not at its full. 
the ways and plans of the enemy have not been fully developed yet. You have not fully understood what Satan and his kingdom is all about. If I come now and judge, you might not b b agree that my, that my judgments are just and fair. I need to allow you more time to see what this thing is all about so that when I come, you can say just and true are all your ways. It's not been long enough. Oh, but I'm glad that there is some good news in the text. Because while the text does remind us that suffering must continue on for a little while, hard times will not end immediately. God has to allow us to endure them just a little while longer. There is good news embedded in the text. Are you with me? Because in verse 11, while God does indicate that the suffering of the brethren is not completed, he does give this word of encouragement. The Bible says it was said to them, they should rest a little while longer. In other words, while God is saying it hasn't been long enough, God is also saying not long. Not much longer will God sit up in heaven and watch and wait. But soon and very soon, God is going to respond to what is taking place on planet Earth. God is taking note of every piece of suffering and every bloodshed and every cry and tear and every blood that drips from your body. God is taking note and he's saying it won't be much longer until he responds. Soon Michael shall stand up. Soon God is going to respond to what is happening on this planet. For the word of God tells us, listen, the word of God tells us in Revelation chapter 12, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and to the, and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that his time is short. In other words, the greater the trouble that the devil causes, it's because he knows his time is almost up. Story is told. I'm going to close very shortly. Story is told about a man who was staying in a chalet in the Swiss Alps. Early one morning, he heard what sounded like an earthquake. Immediately, he jumped up, worried for his life, and he ran to the front desk, and, and he asked, is there something wrong? What's going on? Are the mountains breaking up? Is the world coming to an end? He was scared to death. I see the man isn't from the Swiss Alps. He doesn't know what it's like there. And the story says that the man at the front desk said to him, listen, sir, we on the west side of the mountain. Stay with me. As the sun comes up on the east side, the snow and the ice expand as they begin to warm up. The expansion of the snow and the ice causes a large crashing noise. What you hear is not the sound of an earthquake. It's just the beginning of a new day. If only God's people would understand that the sounds that we hear in the world around us on the news stories, the sounds of murder and rape and carnage, the sounds of thievery and lying politicians, the sounds of, of war, the sounds of poverty, the sounds of persecution is not the sounds of earthquakes. It's the sounds of a new day. I believe a new day is coming. I believe that very soon he that will come shall come and will not tarry. I hear in response to the question of those that are persecuted, how long, O oh Lord, until you respond? I hear God saying, how long? Not long. 
For, 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 for the, 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 soon the sky shall roll back as a scroll. How long? Not long. For my Bible reminds me that he that will come shall come and will not tarry. How long? Not long. Why? Because no lie can live on forever. How long? Not long. Because whatsoever you sow, you're going to reap. How long? Not long. Because mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. My God is marching on. It might seem like truth is being crushed to the ground. It might seem like God's people are being destroyed all around us. But God says to us, how long? It won't be long because very soon. Michael shall stand up. And while we might weep now for the dead in Christ, God has promised that he's going to sound a trumpet. And that trumpet's going to be so loud, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be called up together to meet them in the air. How long? Not long. For John said, I saw a new heaven. And a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And John tells us there'll be no more death. There'll be no more sickness. There'll be no more suffering. There'll be no more pain. John doesn't say this, but I believe there'll be no more cancer. Come on, somebody. There'll be no more diabetes. There'll be no more AIDS. There'll be no more sickness. There'll be no more broken legs or broken arms. There'll be no more arthritis. There'll be no more mortgages. There'll be no more tests in school. Come on, children. There'll be no more bills to pay. The Bible asks how long, but Jesus says not long, because very soon the one that we have waited for we're going to look up and say lo this is our God in whom we have waited for and he has come to save us oh indeed there is more suffering to come but the word promises us that it won't be much longer before you know it your eyes will look up into the sky I don't know if it will be in the morning or if it'll be at noonday or as that song says, it'll be in the midnight hour. But one day soon, we're going to be going home. It's the hope that, that, that transforms us in the midst of suffering. While the rest of the world suffers and they complain and they question, you and I can suffer and still rejoice because we know it won't be long. And every suffering, every heartache, every pain is to fill up that cup so that you and I will realize how wicked the devil is and how wonderful God is. Because before Jesus comes, there won't be any more of this straggling the fence. There won't be any more people one day in the church, the next day in the club. One day eating and drinking right, the next day drinking some strange stuff. There won't be any more of this one day living for God and the next day wanting to, to, to shack up. There won't be any more of this living for God today, but tomorrow I'm going to watch what I want and do whatever I want to do. No, for the word of God tells us that before Jesus comes, he's going to say, he that is just. 
He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. Why? What will cause the amazing transformation so that the people of God will forever remain faithful to him? What causes it? When the cup of persecution is filled, when the cup of suffering and pain is filled, when the world gets a full glimpse of what the devil and his kingdom is all about, God's people will no longer desire anything from the enemy. God is calling on his people to be faithful to him, even in the midst of suffering, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of trials. He's calling on you to be faithful to him because very soon he's going to come. Today, I want to appeal to someone I don't know to whom this appeal is for. But today, I want to appeal to someone. Maybe you have been straggling on that fence, one foot in the church, one foot out the church. I know the lore of the world is great. And sometimes we think of young people in that kind of scenario, but I know that it is strong as you get older because the temptations of money, the temptations of power, the temptations on the job, the temptations uh, at, uh, um, at home, the temptations are great. doesn't matter how old you are. doesn't get easy just because you get older. There might be some things you choose not to do anymore, but there's some other things you might start doing. So for many young people, you come to church and sing and praise God and it looks good and feels good and sounds good. But as soon as church is over, it's as if you can put that religion on a shelf. And then you go and start living your life however you felt like living it. And then... Sabbath is coming around again and you go back to the shelf and get, your, get the Lord again and so you can get your praise on and all the rest of that. That's wonderful, wonderful. God is calling on people who are not one day a week Christians, who are not two hour Christians, but who follow him seven days a week. Today, if you've been struggling back and forth, back and forth, but today you want to commit you're not going to make church a uh, sometimes thing when it feels good. But you're committing yourself to Jesus Christ. Seven-day Christian. I invite you to stand with me. I want to pray for you. All heads bowed and all eyes closed. Today you're struggling with a decision of commitment, of not wavering. The lure of the devil is pulling you. And sometimes, even though you know something is right, you know what is right, but your heart is so drawn to what is wrong, you find ways to justify it, to defend it. I don't know, maybe there might be someone else here today who maybe you are not waving, wavering back and forth on the fence. You've never committed to following Jesus. Today you want to commit your life to following Jesus. I want to invite you to stand and make your way down front. You've never committed your life to following Jesus, but today you want to commit your life to following Jesus Christ. I want to invite you to make your way down front at this time. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we may not understand all of what is written in Revelation, but one thing is sure. Behold, I come quickly. Lord, there in the 22nd chapter of Revelation, you said it three times. Behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. Surely, I come quickly. Reminding us that very soon, this whole thing is going to wrap up. Lord, there's still a little bit more that needs to happen. We're not fully convinced yet, Lord, on planet Earth of how evil the devil is, how wicked his schemes and plans are. But one thing is sure, it won't take much longer. For very soon you're going to come. 
Lord, that's our hope of a soon coming Savior. Lord, that's our hope that in spite of the racism and poverty, in spite of the wickedness and immorality, in spite of the violence and the backstabbing and the gossiping, Lord, in spite of all the trials and troubles of our communities and our state and our country, in spite of the fact that our government can't agree on hardly anything, in spite of the fact that most of our communities are impoverished, in spite of the fact, Lord, that, that the the, the, the unemployment is still high and the funds are still low. In spite of all that we face, your word still says, not long, for he that will come shall come and he will not tarry. That's our hope. Lord, we pray that you would keep us faithful to you. For we cannot keep ourselves, Lord. Lord, we pray that we would recognize how evil the schemes of the enemy are. And may we turn to you, Lord, with all of our hearts. I pray for those that are standing, Lord. Lord, they're not asking that you would make them able to stand. They're asking, Lord, that you would work your will in their life. Because, Lord, we have no power. We don't need to be strengthened. We need to be crucified, put to death so that Jesus Christ and he alone can live out in our life. So, Lord, we ask that you would lay us to sleep, put us to rest, that you would kill our flesh, that our desires might be sacrificed, Lord, that our will and our wants and our plans might be hung on the cross and killed and that Jesus and Jesus alone might rule in our life. Lord, may we not trust in ourselves. For Lord, it was Eve trusting in herself that allowed her to be deceived by the enemy. Lord, may we not trust in ourselves. For it was Peter trusting in himself when he denied you three times. But Lord, may we trust solely and only in you. May we rely solely on you that we might live a life pleasing in your sight. And when you come, Lord, may you say those wonderful words to us, well done, good and faithful servants, and turn to the joy of thy Lord. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. Put your hands together and stand to your feet. We're going to have our closing prayer now, but put your hands together if the word of God blessed you today.